I think with you this morning, I was, while Libby was getting ready, I was reading some scripture and uh, I won't go through the entire Psalm, but Psalm uh, number 127, or excuse me, yeah, 127, kind of jumped out at me. It talks about, you know, one thing I desire of the Lord and one thing I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But this verse jumped out at me. Verse number eight says this. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. What I want us to get is this. God is not looking for us to seek the signs and the wonders. I'm not speaking against signs and wonders. God's not looking for us, his people, to look after something else out there. We're to pursue him. If we would just go after God, seek his face, be in his presence all the time, I believe everything else we have need of would be taken care of. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be added unto you. So I want to share with you here, those that are watching online, stop seeking the miracle and seek the miracle worker. Amen. If we will just draw closer to him and want to know him more, that's one of the things that our first song today, we sang it a few weeks ago. It says, as for me, I will behold your face. I want us to, as a church, to begin to look for not new faces to walk in here, not for miraculous things to happen, but Lord, we just want to be in your presence. Because I believe that we will get close to him. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Amen. That's our desire. I want to go to the Lord in prayer. I especially want to remember Christine just got word that she's on a new medication that is having some complications with it. And Lord knows I understand that. I know there's others in this room. You've battled with some of that. My wife has. I know Amanda has. But probably all of us at some point or another, medication has not done well. So we're just going to pray that either her body adjusts or the doctors make some adjustments and get that right. Uh, I want to ask you to... Uh, pray for it. I won't go into the details of this, but a situation for somebody we know that uh, I've known all my life since I was just a young child. Let's just say that there's some mental issues creeping in and there's nobody there to help. We were just talking about that, Robert, with some other things. And uh, my sister-in-law was trying to step in and, and help in some things, but there's only so much you can do. And it's concerning. It, it's as I learned of it this week, I've been become very, very concerned about it. So I'm not even going to say the name, but God knows who it is. Just would you pray that God would put some people there, some family that would care enough to step in and take care before something really bad takes place. Any other prayer needs as we open today? Remember me. Remember my wife. I didn't even share this. I can't believe this. We went to down to the ball game the other day, and I'm, I'm going to say it the way it is. If you'd have seen it, you'd have died laughing. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen, but it wasn't funny what happened. We just got out of the parking garage, parked the car, walked out the door of the garage before we even crossed the street to go to the stadium. I don't know why, but my wife didn't see the curb and stepped about a foot and a half off into nothing and belly flopped into the street, banged herself up pretty bad. She's got some gashes on her arm that... I'm thinking now we probably should have had stitches. We had it seen by the medical personnel there at Bush Stadium, but uh, she's got a pretty bad gash on her arm and it's too late to do stitches. So would you pray for that? She's very sore. Um, I know she's probably struggling a bit because she also hurt her hand a little bit. But uh, pray for her that she'd be healed up. Thank God she's still got another week before she's got to go back to work. But let's just pray for healing to take care of itself right now. Amen? How many believe right now God can take that pain away and heal that body? Amen. 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 Any other needs? Bill's struggling with a that cold. With a cold? Yeah. Okay. Pray for that. Amen. And, and look, remember Libby's mom. The surgery went well. I probably ought to say this since I talked about it online. We've had several people that were. This is encouraging. People online sending us messages. How's Libby's mom? That means a lot to me. Those of you that are online. And uh, I want to let you know, surgery went well. The doctor seemed to indicate uh, he can't say 100%, but from what he saw, it did not appear cancerous, uh, but she's still having some issues, and they'll get the biopsy back this week. So let's just pray for good results to come back, and they, they will figure out exactly what's going on. But it doesn't appear to be cancer at this point, but we, and we give God thanks for that, but there's still some issues. So let's pray for her. And you. And you. <laughs> 
I have served, I forgot, I have surgery this Wednesday, which by the way, we won't be Wednesday night Bible study because I, it's nothing major. I've just got a bleeding ulcer inside and they're going to go in and see if they can cauterize that rascal and get it stopped. Uh, been at fighting this for quite a while and didn't realize it. So uh, pray for me Wednesday as I'm having the surgery done. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Father, especially today as we celebrate Palm Sunday and re we remember, help us to make the most of this week and realize just what was done when Jesus came and gave his life. We just ask, Lord God, that it would not just be about Easter bunnies and jelly beans and all that stuff, but help us to realize, Lord, what you did for us and give you the praise throughout this week, Lord, and throughout our lives. Lord, you've heard all the needs over here today. Lord, I ask, Lord God, right now, Lord, even as my wife is playing that piano, I'm praying that, Lord, the pain in her, uh, her hand would leave. I'm praying that that wound on her elbow would heal, even on her knees. And I'm asking, Lord God, that just miraculously, she's going to be amazed at what you've done. And I give you the praise for that right now. I pray for Dale, Lord God. I thank you that he's able to be here. But I ask, Lord God, that you would just break that cold up, cause it to leave his body, and be completely whole right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I want to lift up Christine before you. And I ask, Lord God, Lord, I, I don't know how you're going to do it, whether it's through the medication or maybe you'll just heal her body and she doesn't need the medication. But would you take care of this situation? Turn it around, Lord God, and they should be able to sing a song of praise to you. And I give you the thanks for that. Lord, you know, my friend that I was speaking of, Lord, Father, it's a, it's a bad situation. And I just ask, Lord God, would you step into that situation? I don't even want to try to tell you how to do it. But Lord, whether it be through somebody coming in or you could even heal her mind. I'm just asking, Lord God, that something good would come out of this and you would stop anything bad from happening. And I give you the thanks and praise in advance. Now, Lord, as we're gathered together, those in this room, those that are watching online, you know what we have need of. And I ask, Lord God, that you would just be the God of our situation. Father, whatever it is, if it's salvation that is needed, be their Savior today. If there's healing that is needed, be their healer today. If they need provision in their lives, Lord, you are our provider and we trust you. Father, we just ask, Lord God, that you would do what only you can do in our lives. And then, Lord, help us to give you the praise that you are not only due, but, Lord, we owe it to you. And I thank you, Lord, in advance for the testimonies coming back. I give you all the glory. Now, Lord, help us to worship you today. Prepare our hearts to receive the word and let that word do its intended purpose. And Lord, we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing that song she's playing, As For Me. But as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I awake in the likeness. I want to be just like you, Lord. So as for me, I will behold thy face. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I awake in the likeness. I want to be just like you, Lord. So as for me, I will behold thy face. break out an old one, but a good one. Can I say this? How many know that there are some songs in that hymnal? I just wish they'd rip them out. <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. There's, I hate, and I know it's going to be somebody's favorite song, and I'm going to get somebody mad. I hate that song, Hear My Feeble Plea. I don't have a feeble plea. My Bible tells me that I can come boldly before the throne with confidence that God hears and will answer I don't like that phrase. I, I try to change the words anytime I sing it. But this one says, ask us a question. Are you washed in the blood? If you've not been washed in the blood, can I tell you that's where it begins? There's way too many people. I'm going to just say it the way it is. 
I was talking with a dear friend of mine from up here who called me, didn't know I was down in Kentucky at the time. Actually, I think we were in St. Louis by that time. And he was asking about certain things he'd been hearing, and not just here, but other places. As a matter of fact, he'd been to India just for the last month. And he got over there and he preached the cross of Jesus Christ. Now get this. We keep hearing about the great revivals going on in India. And when he preached the cross, the pastor sat with him afterwards while they were eating. And he said, they said to him, we've never heard that before. The problem is we're having a religion, a church without the cross. And I'm going to tell you, that's not the church. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you, The gospel is not prosperity. The gospel is not a feel-good gospel. The gospel says Jesus died and told me I have to die to myself. Amen. Are you washed in the blood? Have you been to that place where you've said, Lord Jesus, I die to myself. Come live through me. That's what this is asking. Amen. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood? stuff that is being preached in churches all the grace of Jesus covers everything it does but it doesn't just cover it washes away we need to get back to the place that we understand God saves us so you don't have to continue in what you once were in I was talking with somebody down in my home area they didn't know I was there and I didn't have time to go see them but we were messaging each other and they asked me said don't you ever miss the times that we used to have. And they started talking about the times we would go to parties and we would go down to the discos. Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> and I said, I don't miss it one bit. 
Because I always acted like everything was good. But you know, the truth was I was bound by that. Without that alcohol, without the drugs I was putting into my body, I didn't know how to function. I couldn't deal with life whatsoever. And I am so glad. See, when Jesus saved me, I stopped doing those things. Was it instantaneous? No, it wasn't. It took some work. It took a struggle to go through a lot of that stuff. And that's why it says, lay aside those garments. I want to sing that again. I want you to really listen to what you're saying. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood. If you don't know Jesus that has set you free from that, I'm just going to say it. You don't know Jesus. If you really know Jesus, I'm going to say it the way it is. When I met my wife, I used to have one of them little black books we talked about. And all these other people that I used to date. And matter of fact, she can tell you, there was one that just kept writing me and calling me for quite some time after we're married until I had to call that girl's daddy and say, would you get her to stop calling me? I'm married now. I belong to her. It's that way with Jesus. All the other stuff stops when we commit our life to him. Let's sing that verse. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin And be washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb Are you washed in the blood In the soul-cleansing blood We've got other songs, but we'll save them for another day. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to get them out. I want to go look at that story. I know it's Palm Sunday. And if you know me, you've heard me say stuff like this. I don't usually like being pigeonholed into this is what I'm going to preach on. But there's a couple days a year that I really want to do. Then Palm Sunday is one of those. In the, I want to look at this story. It's in the, several of the Gospels. I think three of the four, if I'm not mistaken. But it's in Luke chapter 19. And I want to remind you of this story. You know, it, let's be honest, we probably ought to look at this more than once a year. But at least this one time a year, we need to go back and look at this story and understand what was happening. Let me just kind of set the stage for you. This happened to be very early in the morning as we start reading this passage. Uh, most people say it's a Sunday. I don't think the day of the week really matters that particularly much. But early one morning, Jesus and his disciples are walking toward Jerusalem. Jesus stops for a moment, and he tells two of his disciples, once you go on ahead, go into the city, and there you're going to find a colt there that is tied up. Untie that colt and bring it to me. And if anybody asks you, well, let's go ahead and read it. <laughs> Luke chapter 19, go down to verse number 28. As he approaches Bethphage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anybody asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. I'm going to stop there, but keep that finger there or bookmark it or something. Do you ever stop and think about this? The disciples, we were talking earlier about the, the show The Chosen. We were talking about how we see the humanness, the, 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 the realness of the disciples. Can you imagine, let's just say for a minute, let's, I'm not God by any stretch. I'm not Jesus. But if I was to say to one of you guys, I want you to go down the street. There's going to be a car there. And I want you to get in it and bring it to me. And if anybody asks you, tell them Daryl needs it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the response I would expect. 
Jesus basically told them to do that. Go down. You're going to see a colt tied up. Some people have said it was prearranged. Could have been. We don't know. But the disciples apparently didn't know anything about it. And they were told to go down and get this colt. Can you imagine going down, going into somebody's yard and getting the colt, <laughs> turning around saying, the Lord needs it. And you're waiting for those Roman soldiers we were talking about to come and arrest you. They, they had to wonder just what was going on. Here's the thing I want you to think about this. I, I've asked this question of, I don't know, how many people this week, because I was trying to make sure I was right. And I'm pretty sure I'm right. And if you find something different, please come let me know. But I've searched the scriptures this week. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus ever wrote anything other than a boat until this moment. He walked everywhere he went. So what an unusual request this was. Go down and find this colt, untie it, bring it to me. Why? Why are we doing this, Lord? They had no clue what was going on. I, 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 in my mind, I just keep thinking, you know, Jesus has walked hundreds and hundreds of miles through the last three, three and a half years of his ministry. No mention of this anywhere, but now he wants a colt. He tells them the exact words to say. If anybody sees you, just tell them the Lord needs it. I can hear him. Who's the Lord? Can you imagine if I told you to go down the road and get that car? You said, Daryl needs it. I'm like, Daryl who? They don't know who, who I am or what's going on. It happened, though. It's obvious. Jesus knew what was going to take place here. He knew what he was going to face as he rode into Jerusalem. His decision to go into Jerusalem, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. We talk about Palm Sunday, and we focus on the palm branches. That's just a small part of this story. You know, can I say, Brother Dale asked me last week if I was going to have palm branches. He came in today, where's the palm branches? I almost brought some just for you. <laughs> at, our, at the church we did get to, they would say, on Palm Sunday, they had all the palm branches. Right. The kids walked around. And we, that's the point. We have focused on the palm branches, and that's not the story. The story is what Jesus is doing. Jesus knew as he went in. He knew the events that we're going to talk about here in just a moment as he went into the city, but he knew that on the other side of that was the cross. He knew he was going to die. See, on, on top of all of this, here's the thing I want you to get. We don't get this in today's uh, understanding of things. Let me just kind of put it in modern terms and we might get this. You ever notice that when you go into some parks and we see military generals and you see a statue of them on a horse, you know, the, all the idiots, I'm sorry, but they weren't idiots, wanted to tear them all down not too long ago. But if you go in there and a horse was standing it represented something. And if a horse was reared up, it meant something. But here's the point. This is where it came from. In biblical times, and even times beyond that, if my army had gone into your city and overthrown that city, if I'm the leader, I would get on a stallion and I would ride into that city and say, behold your new king. That's what they normally saw. However, if a king had come in, in under times of peace, if Let's use this example here. The Romans were overshadowing, being ironic how we were just talking about how the Romans treated the Jewish people. They persecuted them. They were mean to them. If I, as a Jewish leader, rose up and came in, rather than coming in a military might, there was a tradition that you would get a cult that had never been ridden before, you would ride that and say, I am now coming in, but I'm not coming as a military leader. I'm coming to bring peace. Jesus riding into the city that day was saying to the people, I'm not here to overthrow anybody. I'm coming to bring peace. Now, I want you to understand this. The people following Jesus, even his own disciples, didn't get it. They still thought Jesus was going to rise up, get an army about him. He had hundreds of people following him, 
and he was going to overthrow the military government, or, or excuse me, the Roman government. They were waiting at any moment, and they were getting excited, and they're waiting for Jesus to do something to show this. If you, we were talking about the show of the chosen, if you've seen it, John the Baptist was even asking some of the questions. You know, when is this going to happen? He didn't get it either. None of the people there really understood. And here he comes. They think this is the moment. And he says, approaching the city of Jerusalem, they think this is the time he's going to do it. And he gets on a colt. He was without saying a word, showing them, I've not come with military might. I've come in peace. I've come to bring peace. They didn't have it. The question is, how were, was the people going to respond to this? This is what I want to deal with for a few moments. See, when they recognize that Jesus is coming in peace, their questions are beginning to come because they have waited and waited. For three years, they followed this Jesus thinking he's going to rise up in might. And now... They still haven't got it. And Jesus is hoping that they might begin to understand that his kingdom is not here on this earth. It is a heavenly kingdom. He has taught this over and over, but they've not got it. There's a really small chance that, you know, Jesus was hoping as he got there, they might begin to get a picture. But now as he stands there, he realizes after three years of ministry, they still don't get it. They're waiting for this <laughs> powerful man to rise up to rally the people to overthrow the Roman Empire and he chooses a cult and as they look at this what kind of questions I don't know I, I'm just I'm going to tell you this is I'm not giving you scripture when I say this I'm giving you my opinions of what might have happened on that day I believe that in that crowd of people as Jesus came into the city there was probably some people who laughed this is your leader? This is the guy who's going to overthrow the government? He comes to this moment. The people are behind him. Listen, you got to understand, the word traveled ahead. They heard Jesus is coming, and they thought, this is it. And he comes in on the back of a cult. I believe there was probably some people who laughed. They thought, this is the guy who's going to overthrow the government who says, I'm not here to fight. I'm a lover. <laughs> I've come to bring peace and love to. There's some people looking in probably thinking this guy's a lunatic. There's people thinking that he imagines in his mind himself a king, but look at him. Others probably met him with anger that day. They probably looked and thought, man, we have looked to you. We've begun to believe that you're the Messiah and you come in this form and fashion. <clears throat> Many would probably not even pay attention to what he's writing. They just saw Jesus and they put all their hope in him, thinking he's going to come in and they were ready and eager to do battle. Think about who's in that crowd. I, I've got to be honest, up until the last two weeks as I began to put this message together, I never thought about who might be in that crowd. But no doubt in that crowd of people, there was probably some people he had healed along the way. There's some people who saw the power. There's probably people there who, if they were, themselves weren't healed, they witnessed miracles. They saw the blind healed. They saw the lame man by the pool raised up and pick up his bed and walk away. They probably saw all these other things, and they, if nothing else, they heard him speak with authority. And we read over and over in the Word where they would hear him, and they'd say, where does he get such authority? So they're thinking there's power in this guy. Jesus knew all of this. As he approached the city, who was there waiting on him? And yet he also knew, as I said, the cross was waiting. And nobody in that entire crowd got that. Mm -hmm. Luke is the one who tells us that despite all of it, Jesus set his face steadfastly toward Jerusalem. He was determined to go there. You know, don't ever forget this. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. 
He had the people behind him that if he wanted to raise up a military and go in and fight, he could have done it. They would have followed him. They were ready to fight him. But he set his face toward Jerusalem knowing he would die there. And so we see him riding, or looking down over the city as he came into Jerusalem. The crowd's growing. People are, if you go back and read some of the stories, I'm not going to take the time today, but we see blind Bartimaeus. He heard Jesus was approaching. Others were saying, Jesus is coming. This is it. As he rides down towards there and the crowd is growing, don't forget this, it's also Passover. That is the largest feast for the Jewish people. And they think he's chosen this moment. Can you imagine? Read the Bible and go back and see this. Right before this took place, Jesus has gone to the tomb of Lazarus, the dead man, spoke the word, and Lazarus come out of the tomb alive after being dead. Don't you know that word traveled on into Jerusalem? Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. He was in the grave and stinking. He's raised him from the dead. He's coming here now. Get ready. This is the moment for our Messiah to overthrow this government. They knew that only the Messiah could do this. So the news is beginning to travel from one person to another and the crowd is building up. And here comes our palm branches we keep talking about. They got the palm branches. See, we don't know this. And we just think that this was something that took place with Jesus, but this was a tradition among that culture. That is, a military leader came in and overthrew a government or overpowered a government, however it was done. They would take palm branches and they would wave him, symbolizing triumph, victory. Our day has come. And so they took those palm branches and waved them. Some of them they laid down in the street before him. They took their own clothes off and laid him down saying, we are subject to you. We're going to follow you all the way. That's what was going on that day. They were ready for war to take place. But Jesus had another idea. He had another mission. And he stood there outside the city of Jerusalem looking down, knowing what was getting ready to happen. And the Bible says, Jesus wept. There's only two places in the Bible where it says, Jesus cried. He may have cried more, we don't know. But there's only two places in the Bible where it says, Jesus cried. One was at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. The second one is this day. As he looked down into the city, because he knew they would have followed him into war, but they didn't understand what the last three years of ministry had been about. They didn't understand that the kingdom of God is a heavenly kingdom, that this is a spiritual kingdom, and they still were, even his own disciples, didn't get it. Jesus didn't come to bring war. He came to bring peace. He came to restore fallen man back to a right relationship with the Father. Amen. He came that all the... The peace that was, or excuse me, the peace that we had with the Father was broken in the Garden of Eden. At that moment, it was getting ready to be restored, and they missed it because they wanted immediate pleasure. They wanted a relief from what was going on. So he stands there and he cries. Now I want you to get this. This again. Let me go back to the chosen. I'm not here to pr promote his show. But I love the way they have portrayed this because we were discussing this a little while ago. How did we see the disciples at times arguing with, with each other? The Bible tells us they did this. We saw the real character of them. Can you imagine as they're getting a right, ready to ride into Jerusalem? And I guarantee you, Peter being the guy he thought he was, Peter was ready to fight in a word's notice. Peter's probably walking with his chest puffed out thinking this is our moment, our guys getting ready to overthrow the government, and we're his inner crowd. And we know that James and John were thinking the same thing because they've already been asking him, who's going to be at your right hand? Who's going to be right there with you? And they're thinking this is the moment. Same time, there's a guy named Zacchaeus probably there. Remember Zacchaeus? You know the song, We Little Man Was He? Here's Zacchaeus, who has seen the brokenness of his life restored, that he's no longer 
bound by the Roman traditions, but he's free to be who he was designed to be. Probably the lepers, at least some of them, were probably in that crowd that day. And they're thinking, man, this guy who cleansed us from a disease that was a death sentence, I'm pretty sure Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were probably right there since they were just with him right before. But I want you to get this. Among all of these people who've seen the miraculous, and they're all for Jesus, there was also sinister faces in that crowd. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were probably waiting for any slip-up, for him to say the wrong thing so that they can arrest him and squash what he's been doing. Faces sitting there just hoping and praying that he does the wrong thing so that they can get him because they were waiting for such a moment. I'm sure that the Romans were watching because they were becoming fearful of him. So they're there watching to make sure no revolt rises up because they would have squashed it real quick before the people could rise up and join him. Jesus realized as he rode into town and he saw the palm branches waving and he heard the people shouting Hosanna that not everybody there was for him. There was people just hoping and praying that this was the day that they could kill him. And here's the thing I want you to know. Jesus knew it all. He knew where he was heading. He knew these very people waving palm branches today, just a few days later, were going to say crucify him. Yeah, that's right. He knew how people were, and they were fickle. Why do you think they wanted to crucify him? Because he didn't come in on that stallion. He didn't come in ready to fight. He didn't come in being the military leader they thought. So give us Barabbas. Because this guy's nothing but a joke. That's what they were thinking. And Jesus knew this. So we see Jesus coming into town. And you got to wonder, how were the apostles? Like I said, Peter's probably there already boasting. I, I can imagine... I don't know, maybe it's not fair, but Thomas was always the one questioning everything. And he was probably there a little bit skeptical, saying, you know, uh, I realize we've got quite a following here, but can, are we any match for the Roman government? Maybe, just maybe, that guy named Judas was there thinking, yeah, this is the moment we're going to become leaders and we're going to have all the wealth to ourselves now. We don't know for sure, but here's all these people. People loving him, people hating him. People cheering him, people jeering him. And Jesus stops and begins to cry. I can, can you imagine? i got to confess to you, 64 years old, been studying this Bible a long time, and I never thought about till this week. All these people ready for the conquest to take place, and they see Jesus stop. And tears begin to roll down his face. And see him probably shaking under the weight of what he was carrying. And they're, I don't know about them, but let me just be me for a minute. I'm thinking, I'm going to follow this guy into battle. Right. I, I can just hear people. What's the hold up? Let's go. Let's get this done. We've been waiting. Let's take over. And Jesus stops and cries. The scripture tells us that Jesus was an emotional guy. That's why I told you, I think a week or two ago, I, told you, I, I don't like all these pictures of this stoic, stone-faced Jesus. Jesus was an emotional man. He said when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion. When he saw people that were hurting, he was moved. And we see his emotions again and again. He saw the anger when he saw what they were doing to his father's house. This was an emotional man. And now we see the emotions coming out. That he's crying because he's been there. God in flesh living amongst them and they didn't see him. One of the writers of the gospel tells us that the light came and dwelt among them, and they did not perceive it. And Jesus was experiencing this. They had never gotten the message of peace. After three years, they still didn't understand his purpose. I told you to hold your place. Luke 19, let's go back and look at the rest of the story. 
verses 41. Let's begin there. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone upon the other because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What Jesus was saying here is you have eyes, but you don't see. You have ears and you're not hearing. The fact that they're waving the palm branches showed that they didn't understand. They were still looking for a military powerful move. Let me just give you a history thing for a moment that might help you understand this. Some of you won't know this story, but look it up and you'll see. When the Maccabees came in and overthrew the Syrian oppressors and they reestablished worship in the temple of God, they waved palm branches. They laid the palm branches down on the ground. They took their coats off and they laid them on the ground just like they were doing with Jesus. That's how we know exactly what's going on. By waving the palm branches, they were showing, yeah, Jesus, we're with you. We're going to fight. We're willing to die for you. They thought Jesus was a warlord, that he was going to come in and give the Jewish people the freedom that they wanted and what they didn't understand. He came to give them a better freedom. Yes. He came to give them a freedom that was going to last forever. They were saying that they're ready to pick up their swords. And Jesus said, I want you to love your enemy. That's what he had said to them over and over. Jesus said, I didn't come for the purpose that you're wanting. I came to show you a more excellent way. I came to show you the way of love, the way of peace. He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. They didn't hear him. If somebody smites you on the cheek, turn the other one to them also. But they didn't understand what he was saying. He said, if somebody wants your coat, give them your shirt as well. If somebody asks you to walk a mile, go too. Yes. They totally missed his purpose and his message. The people who listened to him must have thought, beautiful words, but you expect me to love the Romans? Come on. Can I say it? You expect me to love our government today? Absolutely. Doesn't mean you have to agree with everything. Right. But we're to love them. This constantly attacking, belittling, and bashing one another, that is not the way of Jesus Christ. Right. Jesus said, love your enemy. Pray for them. Help them. Those people listening to him thought, but you can't expect me to love Rome. I can, I, I can love those people out there. I can love those filthy people. I can love the rich people. I can love all these others, but I ain't loving the Romans. Yeah, Anybody ever see Blazing Saddles? Yes. Do I want to go there? And they're talking about uh, bring all the people in. They said, all right, we'll bring them all in, but not the Irish. <laughs> That's what they're doing. No, we're not going to love Rome. They're our enemy. They're our oppressors. They've been mean to us. They've demanded things of us that are not even fair. But Jesus would say, yeah, I love Rome too. Rome has seen power. They've seen power and might, but they've not seen the power of love. Right. Jesus was saying, show the world love. Right. The nation of Israel had the opportunity at that moment. I've often wondered what would have happened had they got the message of Jesus. Now listen, I, I don't think any of it took the Lord Jesus nor the Father by surprise. He knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going. But what would have happened had they got the message? What if they would have understood what Jesus, I don't know. I, I really wonder if it would have changed everything. But because they didn't understand Jesus, because they completely misunderstood his mission. Think about this. We'll talk about this more another day. Peter was so disillusioned 
that when Jesus died, he didn't even understand what he'd been told over and over. And everybody's trying to figure out what to do. Peter says, I, I, I love the King James Version, but I dislike it sometimes. Because he says, I go fishing. A lot of people don't understand what Peter says. I'm going back to what I used to do. <laughs> Three and a half years of his life are gone in his mind. I'm going back to what I used to do. Right. And that's the way so many of us are because we accept Christ and we expect everything in our life all of a sudden to get beautiful and rosy and when it doesn't happen. Just this morning I had somebody tell me, I used to be a Christian. I used to follow Christ, but I'm not doing that stuff because it didn't work for me. What are they saying? I didn't get what I want. Yeah, come on. Come on. Christianity is not about getting what you want. It's getting what he wants. Amen. Right. Amen. Showing the way of love means I got to lay down my life if need be. Right. Showing the way of love is I've got to give up my possessions to help somebody else. Right. This is why Jesus came, but they didn't understand. And he stood there crying outside of Jerusalem, basically saying it this way. I stood here among you. I walked among you and you didn't see it. And because of that, you're going to pay a price. Right. And the city of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And that's why he wept that day. We were talking here this morning. Y'all had no idea the conversation I was weaving into my message. These were God's chosen people. He gave them an opportunity. God had loved them and led them out of Egypt years before. Brought them through the wilderness to the promised land. He's given them opportunity after opportunity. And when the Messiah came, they chose to ignore him. Right. Because why? Because they wanted a king. Yeah. They wanted somebody of power and might instead of somebody of love. And because of that, Jesus wept. What a contrast. Instead of being this military leader riding in on a stallion, he stood outside the city and wept. And I, this is what I was talking about. I had never thought about how it must have been for him that day. I've seen movies where they depicted Jesus all cheerful as the people shouted. I think his heart was breaking. Yeah. As he rode through the crowds and they cheered Hosanna, Hosanna, and they were hailing the new king. He was looking beyond the temple. Yes. And saw the cross. That's what this week is all about. It, it shouldn't be a one week a year thing, but we call this Holy Week, but it ought to be a holy life yes. as we understand Jesus Amen. came heartbreaking, and I'm just going to be as real as I know how to be. If it was me and I've done it all for you, I might rain on you people. <laughs> I'm going to go do my own thing. If you're not going to follow me, I'm going to start new somewhere else. Come on. But Jesus kept his eyes on the cross. Yes. Headed there knowing that the people cheering for him today were going to call for his death before the week was out. Right. He saw into the future and he saw the stones of the temple being torn down to where not one stone was left upon another. He saw the blood running through the streets as they were killed, all because they did not recognize the Messiah. They, want, they didn't want a Messiah. They wanted a warlord. Right. How different their lives might have been. It was Matthew, when you read his account of this story, that recorded this. Jesus, looking over that city, said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not come. Things could have been so different. Today, just like the city of Jerusalem, we find ourselves right now in the presence of Jesus. And I know right now people say, but I don't feel him. It doesn't matter whether you feel him or not, he's here. We find ourselves in the presence of Jesus. And I wonder, what is our heart saying? Because a lot of people, they don't want a savior. They want somebody to give. Give, give, give. Take my problems away. Take my enemy away. Take my pain away. Take my heartbreak away. 
Take, take, take. Get all this stuff and just make me feel good. And that's what the crossless gospel is that's being preached all around the world right now. They don't want to preach the cross that says that I have to die to myself. Pick right. up your my cross every day and right. carry it with me. Right. It's not my kingdom. It's his kingdom. Amen. And people Amen. are preaching a gospel that is false today, trying to make people feel good. But I was going to say it is going to condemn people to hell. That's right. Why do you think Jesus said that many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, and they'll say all the things they did. And he says, depart from me, for I never knew you, because he knew this false gospel was going to be preached. And it was no longer going to be about the cross of Jesus Christ. It was going to be about wealth and prosperity and all the blessings that come. Come on. Blessings are real. I want to make that clear. Blessings are real. But that's not why I serve him. I serve him because I love him. Amen. I love him because he first loved me, and I love him because of what he's done in my life, and not what he's given me physically, but what he's given me spiritually. Yes. I'm not bound by the sin that it had me yes. wrapped up in turmoil and pain all those years. I'm free. And, and I said this to somebody just the other day, and they, they're like, I don't understand. And I thought, that's how Jesus must have been. They said, What if you go in and they tell you it's cancer? I said, then we'll deal with it. Well, what if it kills you? And I said, I'll see you when you get to heaven. <laughs> That's just the way I approach life because you know what? My life is in his hands. He's going to give me what I need. He's going to take care. See, go back and read that Lord's Prayer. I don't have time to go through it right now. Go on long enough already. It does not say, Lord, give me Mercedes Benz. Lord, give me a Rolex watch. It says, give me my daily needs. Yes. He will give us what we need. Many times we want so much more because we think God is this genie in the lamp. Right. That's not him. It's just like the Jewish people. They wanted a king that was going to overthrow them and they were going to take the wealth of the Romans and it was going to become theirs. What do you think <coughs> Jesus would see in our faces? If he stood looking at us today, I'm afraid he would look at his church and weep. Because we don't get it. We think it's all about us. I'm not saying wealth is wrong. Please don't anybody misunderstand me. If God has blessed you with wealth, use it wisely. Use it the way he asked you to. But it's not about those things. But let's get down to me and you right here where we live. How many people right now watching me online, watching me here, you're worried about taxes. You're worried about what the doctor's going to say. You're going to worried about is my job going to be there tomorrow. We're worried about so many issues rather than say, am I pleasing God today? That's what it's all about. Amen. Does he see people who are so busy with the things of earth that we don't even think about the Lord again until the next Sunday? Come on. Every day of our life belongs to him. People say, oh, Sunday's the Lord's day. No, every day is the Lord's day. That's exactly what Jesus yeah. was saying. That's why he doesn't, he's not worried about the Sabbath anymore because it's all his. Do you give him out every day of your life? Does he see people who recognize him for who he is? I don't have time to go into it today. I'll tell you more about this another day. But do you know what the word salvation means? It doesn't mean line up and get your ticket punched. Salvation means wholeness and healing. Jesus wants you to have wholeness of life. Not just here, but in eternity. Yes. Jesus wants you to have hope for tomorrow. Your hope is not in, do you win the lottery? My hope is I am eternally secure in his hands. Amen. Do you recognize him as the Messiah? I wonder, are we causing him to weep? I'm not trying to get emotional, but I'm just being as real as I can be. Just within the last week, I had to get alone with God and pray, and Lord, I'm sorry, I've broken your heart again. That's exactly what he means. That scripture I quote all the time, if, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. Do you understand every time we do that, we break his heart? Not just the prayer, but when we sin. When I was in 
studying theology in college. I never thought about this. He said, every time you sin, you drive a nail back in the hands of Jesus again. You re-crucify him. Because we're saying, I can do it my way. Or does Jesus look at us today and do we bring him joy? He doesn't expect us to be perfect, but he expects us to strive towards perfection. Right. I'm my prayer for me and for you is that when he looks at us, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yes, indeed. It's not, did you? I, I don't even go down that road. <laughs> it's not about how many tally marks you got. It's just simply, do you know him for who he is? So many people today, I believe, are still looking for the, the overpowering king, the one who will overthrow the government, free us from the taxes. How many times do we pray, Lord, get us out from underneath this tax? He cares. Hear me, he cares. But that's not it. This is not what life is about. That's right. Had somebody just last night, and I won't go into it all, but somebody on Facebook from over in Iowa was asking some questions, and when I gave it, they didn't like the answer. And they, they said, where is that in the Bible when I gave them scriptures? I said, well, I don't care about that. <laughs> it doesn't fit our agenda, so we push that part aside. Come on. You have to be, I, I'm sorry, I hear people say this all the time. Well, the Word of God is just like a buffet. Take what you like and leave the rest. No. No. You take it all. Even the parts you don't like. And I'm just going to be real. There are some parts, if I was writing it, I wouldn't have put it in there. Because <laughs> God tells me i got to love you when I don't like you. Right. Hello? Right. He tells me i got to love people that have oppressed me. This morning already, before we ever got to church, I was cussed up one side and down the other because I'm a Christian. You know what he says? Love them. Yes. My response was, I'm just not going to participate in your game. The problem is we want to fight. We want to war. Just say, I'm not going to go there. Think of me what you want. I don't really care. I'm going to help somebody out today. The same thing Jesus said to his disciples applies to me and you. If you give them the love, if you show them what God has for them and they reject it, shake the dust from your feet and move on. Yes. He never once called us to stand there and fight. Hello? That's right. Jesus is not looking for a fight. Somebody hear me. Jesus is not looking for a fight. That day's coming down the road. But right now, it is about love your enemy. That's why he came. Love your enemy. Show them love while there's yet time. Because one day, and we talk about the celebration part of it, and one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, but before that, there is a war coming. I want to be on the winning side. Yes. I'm on the winning side. I'm going to say it the way it is. I am on the winning side. I believe I'm looking at a room full of people. You're on the winning side. But other people need to know that the, the fighting and the bickering that we see going on, let's call it the way it is, coming from the church, attacking the world, that's not what he told us to do. He said, love them. Amen. Show them love. That's what Palm Sunday is all about. It's not about, you know, we, we've made it about the celebration, and, and it was, but the point was he was trying to show them one last time, I'm writing this cult to show you I came to bring peace and love to this world. Amen. I want to close. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And Lord, I pray that somebody today got it. The Lord, yes, you're our king, but Lord, you're the king of peace. Lord, you came to bring peace and to restore us back to a right relationship with the Father. Father, help us while there's yet time to share love, to give somebody hope. And Lord, help us to stop fighting. This is not the time for fighting. This is the time to just show them the love of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for sending your son. 
And Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came. Lord, more of this last week, I've seen it more clearly than ever how your heart had to be breaking that entire week. That Lord, there you were among them and they didn't recognize. But Lord, I see that we're doing the same thing. We have the spirit of Christ to dwell inside of us. And we choose to fight. We choose to accuse and we belittle one another. Lord, help us to follow the more excellent way. To offer the love of Jesus Christ to people that are hurting, people that are confused, people that don't understand. We're called to love them. Father, in this little church, let us begin to grasp how deep that love of the Father is. And let us begin to walk in that to others, to show the love of Jesus Christ. Lord, even if it means that we're done wrong, you told us to turn the other cheek. Let them smite that side as well. Even when they take advantage of us, we're called to love them. Father, make us more like you. Let us become instruments of Christ into this world. Let it become more than words that love, acceptance, and forgiveness is found here. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have. Lord, I pray for this group that's here, those that are watching online, that this week, Lord, it's so easy to get caught up in the celebrations. And Lord, they're good things. It's good to have family and friends as we get together. And it's good to see the kids having such a fun time. But Lord, if we lose the message of the cross and the resurrection, we have failed. Father, let us appreciate, maybe even for the first time, just what you've done and what is represented in this week that we call Holy Week. Father, thank you for the freedom that was found because of what took place. And let it not be a one-week thing. Lord, let it become the way we live. And I give you the praise, Lord. I give you the thanks. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let me just share with you real quick, for those online especially, that's our motto here. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. You know what it says? No matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been in life, we're going to love you because that's what Jesus called us to do. That's right. We're going to accept you right where you are. It doesn't mean we're going to leave you there. Amen. You know, do you, I don't see any place in the Bible where Jesus encountered with somebody that they left the same way. Not everybody accepted the message, but they left in grief. Because they heard the truth. We're going to accept you. What you do with it, that's up to you. But we're going to show you that there is a way of forgiveness. Amen. That's the message of the gospel in a nutshell. Yes. If you're in the Galesburg area and you don't have a home church, please come by. I, I shared this with somebody on the phone just a, about nine days ago now. They called me up asking questions. And they said, it sounds so wonderful. It's almost too much to believe. And I said, would you just come? I said, if you come and you don't like it, I said, then I've been a new friend. You've been a new friend and we can part ways as friends. We're not here to corral anybody. But if you need a church, if you need a group of people that will love you, this is the house. Amen. Amen. I'm done. God bless you. You all have a great week. Come back next week. I'm going to say this one more time. You know how many people will go to church on Easter and Christmas that don't go any other time? Use that to your advantage. Invite somebody to come to church next week. Amen. I'm done. God bless you.